Okay, so uh, welcome to the second Chandrasekhar lecture by Professor Suniev. Uh, so already uh, we had a fantastic first lecture. And I think his lecture is a better introduction than anyone can give. And we look for forward to the second lecture. Uh, so please. Okay, thank you, Rishi, for a short introduction. Uh, this night I was able to find the copy of my old talk. I mentioned it last uh, lecture. Uh, my talk on the Centennial uh, Symposium in Chicago. It was very interesting because wife of uh, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar also came there. And as I know, she survived 102 years. But Chandra left us much earlier. And this was this October 17, 2010. And for this, I choose his photo for that talk. I choose his photo where he is, was much younger than in the photo which I'm showing today. Nine years passed, and then you should follow this. Yes, and I will show few very simple slides from that, uh, from that uh, talk, which were always important for me. This is the book of Chandra Sekhar, Radiative Transfer, which was published in Oxford in 1950. Then Chandra Sekhar was approximately 40 years old. This is beautiful book, just beautiful. And in three years, it was translated and published in Moscow. And people told me that amount of copies printed in Moscow was three times higher than the amount of copies printed in Oxford. I was very impressed at that time, but I was unable to find in the book amount of copies which really were published in Russian. This is the cover of that book and this Chandra Sekhar himself. And also I told you that Chandra Sekhar was once in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, and this is his conversation in Sternberg Astronomical Institute with uh, Yakov Zeldovich, you see my mentor here, and with John Archibald Wheeler. I remember only one thing, that practically 100% of time Zeldovich and Chandra Sekhar were speaking with each other, and <laughs> <laughs> Professor Wheeler was just listening. This was <laughs> very interesting for me because he even didn't try to put one vote in between. It was very impressive. But uh, I was very young and therefore I was, uh, how to say, uh, seeing all these small details. But let us return to our lecture and you see here Chandra Sekhar obviously is much more adult. And uh, I will speak today, uh, this is second lecture. I did not finish to speak about the spacecraft, which should be launched very soon, and also about synergy and competition. And yesterday, Dick Bond, Professor Richard Bond from uh, CETA and Toronto University asked me several questions and I was explaining him how, but now I do not remember what I told during the lecture and what I told to Nick Bond. Therefore, I will repeat a few things. First, uh, significant part of this lecture will be again about clusters of galaxies. And this is a propaganda slide of Hubble Space Telescope. Very, very old. It's beautiful cluster Abel 2218, which is not very far from us. And Hubble, maybe majority of people here do not know, but when Hubble Space Telescope was launched, it was unable to give really sharp image. And this was just disaster. And NASA invited Ricardo Giacconi just to become director of the Space Science Institute and to improve the situation. Finally, situation uh, solution was following. They killed ultraviolet, practically killed ultraviolet response of the, of the space telescope because they put additional lenses with refraction and every reflection uh, <laughs> kills a little of, of ultraviolet. Therefore, telescope which was 
built as ultraviolet became optical telescope. But after this correction, uh, telescope was giving beautiful pictures. They were immediately in few weeks, they were after repar uh, repairing it by astronauts, uh, people saw this, uh, how to say, uh, performance verification picture, and this was one of that picture. It's pictures, you see here, beautiful gravitational lenses, Einstein lenses, you see a lot of galaxies and so on. And what we know about clusters, not from uh, Hubble Space Telescope, but just from all ground-based uh, ground optical observations made for tens of years. People were amused because these clusters of galaxies were most massive objects in our universe, and these objects, how to sell to you, were tremendously interesting. One of the one of the most beautiful things was that there are in most rich clusters there are thousands of galaxies which are moving in huge potential well with velocities of the order of thousand kilometers per second. And when they are moving with velocity 1,000 kilometers per second, and crossing time of the core of the cluster is only a few hundred million years, and universe is uh, 13 billion years, then you understand that there is a gravitational force which keeping them together. And this was measured in many clusters, and people immediately predicted if there is gas, then temperature of gas should be of the order of 5, 10 kilo electron volts. And so that velocity of the galaxies should be of the same order as sound velocity. Some galaxies are moving with velocity, with supersonic velocity, some subsonic, but average velocity is of the order of sonic velocity. And I told already last time that beautiful thing is this very distant galaxies who are amplified, lensed by this cluster of galaxies. And today we know, everybody believes this, that gravitational potential defined by invisible dark matter. Nobody knows what is this dark matter. 20 or 10 years ago, everybody believed that this is, how to say, massive particles which are moving and masses of these particles are maybe 100 GV, maybe 10 GV, and people were looking for this particle. They, up to now, there are great experiments, ground-based experiments, but nobody sees any traces of their presence. And today, I'm very interested uh, that Jerry Stryker, uh, Lam Hui, and uh, two people from Institute for Advanced Study, Scott Tremain, and great string theoretician, everybody knows him, uh, they wrote paper where it is written in that paper that maybe these dark matter particles have mass of the order of 10 in power minus 20 grams. They're really negligibly not massive and they can reproduce practically everything, hmm, EV, sorry, and I, what I told Gram, no, 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 Gram never, <laughs> Gram is 10 power minus 20 is, uh, proton is even uh, 10 power minus 23. It's EV and these particles, maybe axions, maybe other particles, they maybe are playing here the role of dark matter. And again, a lot of people, yes, this paper, which was written in the end of 70, uh, 2017, now has more than 290 citations, and every day they are coming and coming, and, and a lot of young people now are considering how condensate behave of these particles, and so and so on. It's very interesting, but for us, important only one thing. This is gravitational potential. And if we will think about this gravitational potential, new era came when great X-ray telescope, Chandra telescope, and this XMM Newton telescope of European Space Agency were launched, 
and they measured brightness of the gas, its temperature, and electron density. And this is nearby co coma cluster, only 90 megaparsec away from us. And in this cluster, temperature of gas changes from 5 keV to 9 keV. Sound velocity is higher than 1,500 kilometers per second. Average electron density there is only uh, three particles per 30 centimeter cube, three milliload really density. But even if density is so small, volume is huge. Therefore, this source emits a lot of X-rays, and we can observe many, many things with it. And second, it is possible because now you have the sound speed, and you can make model of atmosphere. You know, if somebody will measure what is the height of atmosphere of the Earth, this is a problem for the schoolboys. We know that height is of exponential atmosphere is of the order of eight kilometers. We know temperature, so on. We can immediately find what is the mass of the Earth and what is gravity on the. It is just Boltzmann equation, and you immediately write what is the Boltzmann atmosphere. And people know how to do this, and a lot of people, there are several in the room, who are doing this exercise every day with real observations, and they measure what is the mass, just from X-ray observation, what is the mass of the total of in these clusters of galaxies. And this mass, for example, for coma cluster, is of the order of 10 and power 15, solar masses, huge mass, that's huge. But if we return in time, we will remember this person. I think it is great person, but when you see his face, you understand that it was not extremely easy <laughs> to live with him. And when I started to visit Caltech, uh, people told me that last years, um, there, is, there was star uh, old buildings of the physics department, which was two uh, floors above the ground and seven down. And he was going every year one floor down his office. <laughs> yes, and this man was absolutely great observer and also great physicist. What he did, he, this is the same coma cluster which I showed you X-rays. He was, these are words, I just took them from Wikipedia. Why observing the Coma Galaxy Cluster in 1933, practically 100 years ago, this person, Zwicky, was first to use the Virial CRM to infer the existence of unseen matter, what is now called dark matter. He told missing mass. He measured, he knew what is the radius. It was necessary for him to measure mass. And he told, according to Virial theorem, I will not write uh, coefficients of the order of two, that uh, we all know ratio with kinetic and, between kinetic and potential energy. This was potential energy, this was kinetic. And therefore, he got very simple formula to estimate what the total mass of the cluster. Zwicky was able to estimate also what is the masses of individual galaxies of the of some, several hundreds. He spent a lot of time and he was great experimentalist and he had access to the best telescopes in the United States. What it occurred? The sum of galaxies was significantly 30 or 40 times less than necessary mass just to keep galaxies together. He wrote this and everybody was silent. During from 33 to 80s, maybe many tens or even hundreds of astronomers were trying to repeat this exercise. Everybody was getting the same result, but because it was obviously wrong, everybody was silent. I remember how Samuel Kaplan from Nizhny Novgorod told me about this story and told me that there is something in the cluster of galaxies. And I came and told this to Zeldovich. 
Zeltovich never heard about this at that time. And Zeltovich told me, it's great. Maybe there is a guess, and we should find way using CMB to find that guess. At that time, there were no X-ray detection. But X-ray detection came in a year or two, and it was it showed that guess is not enough also. What we know today, and today, this is what we know. That 80% of mass here is the dark matter. Yes, we do not see, but gravity is there. Therefore, we are telling that this is gravity. Second, all numerical computations for the when particles are interacting only due to gravity permit you to show that really this thing is giving you the shape of potential, everything. It's absolutely great. Then, few percent of total mass produces you optical light. These are galaxies and stars there. And this only few percent. And 15% of mass we can observe now using X-rays and CMB. And this is hot gas, which is feeding this volume and which is inside this great potential well, and it's very hot because in opposite case, it will collapse and will produce us additional galaxies. This is what we know, and this is what is observed. We see this, this again, not hot gas, this is TMB diminution of the brightness from Planck, and these are stars, and this is dark matter. Additional thing which we can uh, uh, yesterday, this was a question from uh, Dick Bond, and I discovered the picture from XMM, how it is observes cluster of galaxies, I think at redshift of the order of 0.4. And you see here lines. But this is, uh, if we recompute this to the rest frame, it would be 6.7 keV line, and this is well-known system of the lines of helium-like iron ion. What does it mean, helium-like iron, uh, iron ion? You have helium, you have iron, and iron has 26 electrons. But when temperature is high, then electron collisions are taking photoionize the atom, and you are losing electrons. And the temperature of the order of 1 keV, when temperature is 10 power 7, nucleus with 26 protons, and uh, yes, it is surrounded with only two captured electrons. And this is helium atom, but with charge of the um, nucleus, 26. This is helium like iron, it is beautiful because there is a lot of relativistic corrections here, uh, a lot of atomic physics, and I can tell you this is most abundant iron and it's producing, uh, again, due to the electronic collisions, it uh, produces this line and we can measure what is the redshift because this line is coming at the energy uh, 5 point something instead of 6.7. We can measure what is the redshift. And Erosita yesterday, Dick asked me, Erosita will be able, just during the survey, measure the redshift without any optical support for at least few thousand clusters. You need 50 photons for a cluster to measure such light. Uh, spectral resolution is okay. It will be uh, at least, we hope, not much worse than uh, XMM Newton uh, spectral resolution. Yes, second thing which I mentioned yesterday, but was unable to show picture, is the following. <laughs> when I was uh, reading first cosmological books, I was amused by one thing. There was an example that if I have rigid rod, this is dimension, and then I go in the universe slowly from the observer. In the beginning, picture is like in Euclidean world. The angular dimension you see in arc minutes of my road will decrease. 
and it will take place up to redshift point 3.4 and then it will start to increase the same rot due to the curvature of the universe it will became i will see it is big as a bigger and bigger angular dimension it's very well known fact everybody who is reading cosmology books they are uh, reading this and for me for this cluster business most important is the following that from redshift point three or point four up to redshift four you see here angular dimension of the cluster of galaxy with dimensions of one half of megaparsec just physical one half megaparsec is practically the same and it's close to 1.5 or 2 arc minutes and majority of clusters of galaxies should be in such dimension and therefore we need instruments which have angular resolution of the order of one arc minute and then we will immediately see that object is not point like but it is diffuse it's bigger than point like uh, object and in addition it has finite dimension what we can do it's very very important it's also very important for the effect which i described during uh, previous lecture because during that lecture i told you that uh, effect doesn't depend on redshift if i have similar amount of cloud with similar amount of electrons and with similar temperature I will see it at any brightness in the center will be the same at any redshift. And here I have the same angular dimension. I should multiply brightness to dimension. They all have luminosity, which depends on the distance, on the, in this practically constant in very broad region of the redshift. This was unexpected and a lot of people were not believing this but these were not physicists astronomers were not believing because for physicists physics is important for astronomers in the beginning they were not believing that universe is expanding but when they believed this they knew that every distant galaxy is redshifting and therefore all spectral lines are redshifted all spectrum is redshifted and here we were telling no there is no redshift it is the same at any redshift because all formula depends on the h nu divided to k ktr and tr is increasing of radiation due to the expansion of the universe but at before temperature was higher like one plus z redshift and similarly frequency behave in the same way therefore there is no redshift depend and for astronomers this was very very unnatural okay i told you about this and i will tell you additional physical thing which i uh, told also to dick this was a reply to his question it is the following why it is so good for us to observe these devices which have angular resolution of the order of one arc minute this is the power spectrum of the angular fluctuations uh, of the universe you see these are acoustic we discussed and there is also silk dumping joe silk is one of the people in the on our earth whose effect will survive at least 10 or 15 i don't know billion years you know therefore he made the i don't know how to say this monument for himself that the which carries his name silk dumping and you see in this silk dumping that these are primordial acoustic waves which produced us this uh, and, uh, this um how to say quasi periodic dependence but already at five arc minutes with at resolution of planck they are much weaker than the maximum but when i go to one arc minute here they are practically six orders of magnitude smaller than on one degree scale six orders of magnitude 
This is the reason why telescope like South Pole Telescope and even Atacama Cosmology Telescope, it's very difficult for them to detect clusters here. If they know that cluster is there, they can do this. But primordial fluctuations are much stronger. But when you go to one arc minute to the way is the resolution of these instruments, then you are able, you do not have um, competing, uh, um, competing background, uh, which uh, making your uh, situation with observations much more. I will tell addition thing, yes, here, why also it is important for us to question of synergy, why it is important for us to have data for, from X-ray emission, which is bremsstrahlung or emission in the lines, because that emission needs interaction of two particles, one electron moving and nucleus, which attracts it. Here, then acceleration and emission of photon. Therefore, this process intensity of X-ray radiation is proportional to square of density of electrons and dimension R of the core of the cluster. But effect on CMB, it is just Thomson scattering. And Thomson scattering is proportional to an E and amplitude is proportional to temperature. Therefore, this pressure multiplied to R, this is first degree of density and he is queer. It's absolutely great because just combining these two observations, you immediately are getting what is the radius of the characteristic radius of the cluster of galaxies. And this characteristic radius, you are measuring it knowing only physical constants and bright distribution of brightness. And this gives you excellent way to measure Long, um, uh, Hubble constant. How? Because you have the angle dimension of the object, and you know if you know velocity, you can do everything. This is very interesting situation also, and people are trying to have to get both observations. And I will show also why it is so useful to have this effect. These are observations of Planck. And this is well-known Shapley supercluster. Great supercluster in which there are two very close clusters of galaxies. I think that majority of you know it. I have picture, but I haven't time to show it. But Dick showed it. There was, um, there was um, uh, on his picture also was Shapley supercluster. And you see here, the effect on CMB. This cluster of galaxies, this cluster of galaxies, and in between there is a bridge. And this bridge you cannot till now see in X-rays because density of this bridge is very low and you need an E-square. Therefore, it's difficult to observe. No one spacecraft till now observed it. But Planck is observing it, and I heard that Atacama Cosmology Telescope also. It's very interesting just because you specially designed to, the, to observe first degree of very small value, and <laughs> for X-ray emission, it's necessary to work with the second order correction, which is much smaller. And this is, these are Planck data. Yes, and Planck observed several such bridges, which are very interesting. Yes, I will return now to the to the uh, to the spacecraft. I think it will be better if I will just go to here to it, and then we will return. Uh, I told you already that on 14th of December. I was in the Lavochkin industry and saw these two instruments. One instrument is Erosita, made in Germany, and this Russian instrument made in the tele Grazing Incidence Telescope, made in all Russia nuclear center, where Zeldovich was working more than 
15 years for getting his medals for hydrogen, atomic, and so on. Well, this life, uh, yes. Uh, what will be when, if we will be lucky, and in June we will launch the spacecraft, what we will get? First, it will be, I told already, in the second Lagrangian point here, so that moon, earth, and sun always will be on one side of the this is very interesting point because this equilibrium between uh, centrifugal forces and gravity, gravity toward Earth and Sun. And you see then they are equal in this point just because centrifugal force compensating difference or, or compensating these two forces, two, uh, two forces uh, gravitational forces. And distance is 1.5 uh, million kilometers, and we will fly 100 days. First, 40 days we will use only to make, how to say, um, so that all gas will go out from the spacecraft to make everything in vacuum, then it will be possible to walk without detectors. And after 40, we will start calibration and performance verification uh, observations by, of two telescopes, just on the way. There are many interesting, um, interesting objects which we, we will observe, but these are well-known objects, just to show what we can do. And then we will start eight all-sky surveys during four years, just due to the rotation, and these are our dreams. I showed you yesterday this grazing incident, seven telescopes of Erasita. This again on a different stage of, um, of, of the life of flight uh, unit. And these are detectors, huge CCD chambers, this dimension. Why they are so huge, they are very big, because we wish to observe simultaneously one square degree on the sky. Normally, for example, Chandra spacecraft is observing uh, on the sky something of the order of few arc minutes. And here we will observe one degree to one degree. This will make our scan much faster. This is the idea. I will not go to details. But what is important, we will have excellent angular resolution. Here it will be 136 electron volt at 6.4 keV line. You see it here. Everything is measured on the ground on calibration facility we have in um, in Garhe, in München. A trumper arranged 160 meter vacuum tube, and on one side of this tube there is an X-ray source. And on another side is our detector, and we are looking how everything is working. But it's, I can tell you that everybody knows that there is K alpha line of carbon with energy 277 electron volts. But I never seen it resolved. And these CCTs are resolving this line. We can say, understand, you can measure very, very uh, plasma with, uh, which, is, which has temperatures only a few hundred thousand. It will be very interesting. The people are proud. And why it is important? There is old paper of Sen and Astriker, and it is important because they just asked, where are the baryons? Several people, Masataka Fukugita, Peebles, Jerry Astriker, they were trying to compute where all baryons, which are existing according to standard cosmology, do we observe them now? They took into account all clusters of galaxies, all stars in the universe. They estimated how there are black holes, how many white dwarfs summarized everything, and they are getting less than one half of baryons. More than half of baryons are hiding, and nobody has even idea how to find them. And 
these people from Princeton in 1999 told that there are in intergalactic space shocks, filaments, and this in these filaments plasma has temperature between 10 to 10 power 5 to 10 power 6 Kelvin, and there should be soft X-ray emission. And after that, a lot of people were trying to observe, and all detections are on the level of 2.5, 2.7 sigma. In reality, it's very difficult to see this gas, but numerical computations show that this picture is correct. Especially designed these uh, detectors and mirrors so that it will be possible to observe also soft. I hope that something interesting will come. Then just to speak for the normal astronomers. Okay. Uh, what is this list? This list shows the stars from which people already observed X-rays. And there are, you know that our sun, especially during solar flares, is emitting X-rays. And there is, at some moment in reality, uh, solar, solar X-ray astronomy was real science before people started to detect extragalactic or galactic objects. And now, when we estimate, oh, excuse me, how many stars we can detect, result is the following. We, during this scanning whole universe, only in our galaxy, we should detect of the order of half a million of stars and a lot of flares and so on and so on. In reality, because majority of people now are interested in cosmology, it's not interesting for majority of people, and, but there will be a lot of data. And you understand yourself, just in our galaxy, we will observe of the order of half a billion of X-ray stars, and I hope that we will detect something. And these stars are from very late and tiny M dwarf, having mass, for example, 0.3 or 0.2 solar masses, up to giant O5 stars with masses of the order of 30 or 40 solar masses. And all of them are producing X-rays on some level, shocks in vicinity, and so on. This will be our problem, what to do with all these objects. Now, this is comparison. I don't think it's good to uh, tell to theoreticians how good, is the, uh, how good are um, detectors. But mirrors and detectors of Erosita, this, they have enormous production of effective surface area of uh, telescopes and detectors multiplied to field of view. It is much higher than XMM and many orders of magnitude better than Chandra spacecraft because due to this very wide angle which is observable by this spacecraft. And this is great and this is main propaganda slide in reality. There is second telescope, I told you it is hot, and main goal for this telescope is to observe Compton seek AGNs, because there are black holes which are eating so much matter that there is enormous amount of matter in accretion disk around, and this accretion disk is optically thick. Therefore, we do not see central engine which produces X-ray. We are unable to observe this. They are absorbed, absorbed. But in hard X-rays, it's very difficult to absorb them. Only Thompson cross-section is working. Therefore, if you have hard detectors, you can do this. And this detector will do such things. This is sensitivity of Erosita, and this is sensitivity of Arctic Sea. Therefore, telescope will absorb up to or so on, uh, keV starting from 0.2 or 0.3 keV. This energy band. And this is simulations. What will be the picture? This is the best on very small uh, piece of sky simulation, uh, observations and simulations that are of XMM Newton. This is Rosato Sky Survey. You see 
And this is what Erosita will give you. Enormous amount of sources, millions, millions, and millions. And already a lot of people now are speaking that it will be possible to compare this map with the best radio maps like VLA, EVLA, for example, uh, this American interferometer with Alma, and with best optical maps. And to see, are these the same sources or not? You know <laughs> why some sources are radiating radio and others are extremely bright in X-rays? Why these objects are, how to say, separated to different classes? We will see all objects which are bright in X-rays in the whole universe. It's very important. I already showed this picture, and I was, I was amused by a small girl who came and told me, oh, but black hole should be black here, <laughs> and you are showing that it's not black. First, she was absolutely correct, but, you know, all these black holes, or majority of them, we don't know why, but many of them are producing jets, ultra-relativistic jets, which are uh, shining toward us due to synchrotron emission in optical band, in radio, and so on, and people are observing. And this is obviously not scientists, he did this, but I like myself the movie, because it's very, very old movie, which shows that all this thing rotates, and as you more close and close to black hole, rotation is faster and faster, this Keplerian rotation, and nearby layer, layers have this differential rotation, they have, how to say, they have different velocities, and therefore there are uh, tangents and so on between them, and here magnetic field is produced, it's very beautiful thing, and you see that turbulent viscosity is coming, and only due to the viscosity, we have here the slow motion toward black hole and feeding it. And this is very interesting because I just can tell you that majority of black holes which we are observing, very bright quasars with masses of zod of few billion solar masses, just to feed them, they need to radiate so much, one Earth per second. It's necessary to provide them is one Earth per second. And it's uh, very interesting how everything. And main dissipation, as you are more and more close to black hole, you produce more and more energy, and then we, uh, you are falling, and this already goodbye. This matter doesn't produce for us useful thing. Yes. We dream to detect this estimate, it would be, might be two, maybe four, millions of active galactic nuclei, which are supermassive black hole. And a group of Marat Gilfanov computed, will be it possible to measure baryonic acoustic oscillations. With three million objects, if we will know the redshift, we will find 15 sigma baryon oscillation of the objects which are bright in X-ray. We can see, are they distributed in the same way as optical objects are distributed? And this is, if they are distributed in the same way, then it's trivial, you know, <laughs> okay, they are similar. But if they are distributed in a little different way, this will be sensate. Therefore, we should do and we should check this. This is uh, one thing, and there are many, many things which people can do. I can tell you, for example, it would be possible to observe a Chandra Dizis. We will see how uh, minor planets, comets, are illuminated by solar flares and scattering of the X-rays, and also emission due to the charge exchange will come to us and we will can trace motion of comets. Just this just by product. But there are many people who are doing planetary science are now interested in the field. Now what we will do, it is a Planck spacecraft and picture of Planck, Planck rotates and you see it beams, oh excuse me, 
so rotates and then there is a strip on the sky and then axis every day axis follow the sun one degree per day and you can get a uh, whole sky will be covered in a uh, in a half a year this is picture for w map and three objects sun uh, moon and um, uh, us are from one side most important that period is four hours therefore six times per day we will ab observe every source in this strip on the sky 360 degrees to one degree it will be measured yes and now i will tell you why we need also eight scans we will follow we will follow variability and you see these objects first we will observe and see gamma ray burst afterglows they are shining weeks or even sometimes months and we can see them and even we were unable to see main uh, event gamma ray burst itself we will see traces what what is the afterglow uh, we will see also uh, soft gamma ray repeaters we will see OLXs, ultra luminous X-ray sources in different galaxies, X-ray binaries, classical novas, dwarf novi, flare stars, everything, and it's very different variability from 10 to the power minus two seconds here up to three years. We can observe. Most interesting for us will be a gen tidal disruption. I already told you when star is going very close to the black hole. Tidal, see, tidal forces disrupt the star, and we will see huge X-ray flare when this matter will feed the monster black hole. You can see this. And this hour, at that time, he was our student. Now he is a postdoc, Ildar Habibulin. His estimate is that we will see thousands of such tidal disruption events over four, four years if it is true then we will see practically how these black holes are really eating stars and not just diffuse gas what contribution is coming from the disrupted star there will be very interesting things because orbit is going and orbits are intersecting in two points one is north ecliptic pole and this southern ecliptic pole and this will be will be places where we have five ten times more exposure than average on the sky this is our deep survey region we will just get it in addition in addition yes again clusters of galaxies we will observe and i can tell you that uh this is millennium simulation it's very old simulation performed by virga group leader was volker springel now new director of max planck institute for astrophysics in garking and this was enormous at that time this was only this amount of particles which were not interacting but only gravity was playing role this was dark matter and with this dark matter he was looking how everything is going and you see here the knots in some structure seen slice of the universe and in every knot this is cosmic web and in every node there is a cluster of galaxies cluster of galaxy and these are filaments and dark matter and normal baryons are flowing increasing mass of the cluster of galaxies just you can see this on the movies i, I hope that all of you have seen it there on the web page of Volker and institute you can see this it's beautiful pictures but for me it's most important that they are not and therefore if i return every this point here is a cluster of galaxies and they form they are knots of the web structure of the unit and this is absolutely great and we will detect we hope to detect all massive clusters of galaxies in the observable universe 
and this is something tremendous. And when we were negotiating with our German colleagues, at that time director was Günther Heisinger, who is now scientific director of European Space Agency. Günther was telling, oh, we have small device, not small, few hundred kilograms, which can observe a uh, few thousand degrees on the sky. And I told, no, we will provide spacecraft and so on, only in the case if we will observe all objects in the universe. And he told me, how it is possible? This will be very heavy device, and device is 800 kilograms, and it will be launched. This is And we are very glad. Yes, and I can show you, you the ability. These are simulations of Eugene Churazov. You can see here real observations of Chandra spacecraft. The spacecraft named after Professor Chandra Sekar. And this is 30 pointings and two milliseconds, two million seconds, you know, were given to observe this cluster of galaxies at redshift 0 0.06, you see. And there is some structure. And this is one pointing. 80 kiloseconds by Erosita, and you see all details which are here, you can see here immediately. And this is, you know, instead of two milliseconds of the work of extremely expensive spacecraft, you can do this using much cheaper spacecraft and only in 80 kiloseconds because field of view is so huge and angular resolution is enough. It's specially designed for this problem. Yes, second question is the following. We all know our universe before. There were no stars, no galaxies, no clusters of galaxies. And everything in the universe is growing because we have gravitational instability, because structure is growing with time. And if it is growing, then there should be very at high redshifts. This is green curve is redshift 1.4. You should have very small amount of massive objects, 10 power 14 or 10 power 15 solar masses per cubic a moving megaparsec. But if you go to redshift 0.5, much more. And if you go to redshift zero, you have a lot of them, this massive object and they continue to merge. We see the shock waves there. We see that these clusters are growing. And what is important is that if we will measure all clusters of galaxies from redshifts of the order 1.5 to us, we can see how cluster is growing. And this cluster is just going to kindergarten. This already to the school. This already graduated from university. And at the same time, you know, weight is increasing also. Therefore, it will be possible to see all what is occurring in the universe. And number of most massive cluster is extremely sensitive to cosmology. We can measure a lot of important parameters of the universe, including how much there is dark matter, what amount are baryons, what is the Hubble constant, a lot of things, this independent method. Second, there is, I told you several times, will Erosita detect all clusters of galaxies? Question is what we are speaking about, about thousand counts per cluster, 50, cluster uh, counts per cluster or few uh, few photons per cluster there is person in uh, in uh, God, uh, in uh, Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics Alexei Vikhlinin he was student in our group he now can distinguish point source with Chandra spacecraft point source from cluster of galaxies having four photons because he knows so well the grounds and immediately is telling no no this uh, diffuse source and this point source it's enormous but we in general we are thinking about 50 counts per objects then we will be absolutely sure and it's possible to ask other people to observe the same object what will be in this case at redshift three 
we will observe objects with more massive than 10 to the power 14 solar masses in dark matter. The number will be only 80,000. Uh, 80, and this will be with zero zeta, we will observe only 40% at redshift 3. At redshift 2, now we are speaking about clusters with mass 3 times 10 to the power 14 solar masses. The number is 8,000. And we will observe 100 percent, all of them, in the whole observable universe. Everything up to the horizon. No one will, you know, <laughs> tell us, oh, "Oh, you will not see me." And then we go to redshift of sort of one. Then there are 10 in power 15 solar masses cluster. There are 50. We will observe all of them. And I am then now. South Pole Telescope or Atacama Cosmology Telescope or Planck is detecting such stores. So I think only 40 <laughs> remain. You know, there is this space for us to do discoveries is decreasing because other people also working and doing ground based astronomy. Yes, but there is a lot of additional things I will not speak about this thing i will speak about a lot of beautiful physics just every cluster which we are discovering we see the shock waves because subcluster is coming from filament and several times is going you know in this gravitational well and there is gas and you have shock waves and we are observing these shock waves. And it's very interesting. Now it's possible to see. Maxim Markevich, also our former student, did this. That you see how dark matter is going ahead. And baryons are decelerated by the shock wave. And they're going more slow. People detect these things. People discovered enormous clusters. For example, South Pole Telescope discovered a redshift. Is 0.6, the cluster of uh, Phoenix cluster of galaxies. It was immediately observed by Chandra, Galax, and Magellan telescope. They found cooling flow. A lot of matter is going to what central black hole. Starburst, 800 solar masses of new stars are, how to say, appearing in the central part of this cluster per year. The normal speed. And in the center, there is black hole in the center. And we see it in several different bands. We see bright filaments. It's so rich. You see this, uh, this cooling flow. OK. I will uh, knock, not uh, speak too much, but before. Uh, people always request what are the conditions it is, pos is it possible to write proposals or not. Agreement is the following, that in the beginning it will be API instrument. Data, data split, 50% belongs to Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, extra uh, Earth physics, and 50% to the Space Research Institute in Moscow. German data, they are dreaming to make them public after two years, after the finish of the scans, uh, and in, within three releases. Now, <laughs> flight was two years old flight, uh, slide, therefore now it will be 2022, 2024, and 2026. This is the time when German part of the sky will be released, Russian side, still is silent when it will be open. Yes. Working groups, clusters cosmology, AGN, normal galaxies, compact objects, diffuse emission, supernova remnant, stars, solar system, time domain astrophysics. I should mention that we will measure, detect 10,000 elliptical galaxies on the sky and 10,000 star forming galaxies like M82, just because there are uh, objects like ultraluminous uh, accreting objects and so on. We will 
detect also what they're produced. This is all dreams. How much? Okay, five is okay. Oh, maybe seven, I will try. Because I decided also to show this picture, everybody is asking me how you are dividing scan. We were discussing this and then Peter Pradel proposed that there will be scan from the north pole of galaxy to the south pole of galaxy, direct line, and this will belong to Russia, this will belong to Germany, and one degree strip will be common just to observe together. Everybody wanted to observe galactic center and Sagittarius A star. It will be joint. You see it? And there are, we are discussing with different optical people where we can absorb and go. Yes, I told you that it's possible to do a lot. X-ray observations here, optical Hubble, and this black is the CMB observation. These are data more than, sorry, more than thousand clusters observed by Planck. Uh, this is already uh, what is what was observed by South Pole Telescope and Atacama Cosmology Telescope is here, it's green. These clusters which are detected by Atacama Cosmology Telescope. I have seen and already map of the sky, half of the sky, 20,000 degrees, scanned by Atacama Cosmology Telescope and there are 1,495 clusters of galaxies which are uh, for which Atacama Cosmology Telescope has redshift and has X-ray detection. These are very important things. And now SPT told me, uh, Lindsay Blim, that they have of Zodo 5,000 clusters and they are ready to publish 1,400. It is really massive business now. A lot of people are doing from the ground. And this is beautiful. And for me, it is important that 3G phase now, 16,000 kilometers, cryogenic kilometers, are staying in the focal plane of the South Pole Telescope. It's enormous because they started with 10, then 900, and now with 16,000. And they wish to do more and more. And this future, I already showed you this. This will be competition between Erosita, Erosita, this sensitivity of Erosita to clusters with 10 power 14 solar masses, 10 power 15, 10 power 13. And this is what SPT 3G, 3G wishes to get. Together, Atacama Cosmology Telescope and SPT, they're talking about few hundred thousand objects on the whole sky. It is just a domos. And it will be great to overlap Erosita map with 100,000 clusters and group of galaxies onto high quality Y map of this Z effect map from the future CMB spacecraft. Then we will see a lot. This is Klaus Dulac computations and you see many, many clusters of galaxies which will be possible to see and a lot of groups, enormous amount. Very interesting also that Planck sees gravitational, <coughs> uh, you know, this is the last scattering surface and due to presence of irregularities in mass, photons cannot go straightly, but there is a weak lensing. They're coming to different places. It would be very interesting to observe picture in CMB picture, which is coming from very high uh, distances is data from local clusters of galaxies, which are not far. Therefore, this will be a lot of additional information. Okay, and I can tell you as usual, I'm telling this when there are experimentalists, but you are serious. Nevertheless, I will tell you all bulk of this work was done in 6972. And I can tell you that without great progress of solid state, cryogenic technology of grazing instruments, mirrors, and polometers able to detect 
lab millimeter sources of celestial radiation, development of spacecraft technology, it would be impossible. And I am very grateful to hundreds of physicists, engineers, and astronomers who made this possible. And I am enormously grateful to my mentor because he thought in the beginning that all these effects never will be observed. But he told physics is so beautiful that let us publish. And it is good that he permitted to publish this. You see these things, I am very, very glad. Yes, thank you very much. Now between questions, yeah, please. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned the result that uh, beyond redshift one, I think for certain range of redshifts, the these observed uh, cluster sizes would be independent of redshift. Yes. So I was wondering, isn't this result uh, based on model of the uh, closed universe with lambda is equal to zero. No, no, so no, if no. It, it is uh, okay for our you for the this graph which I showed you, it is the best model which is accepted by everybody today. Okay. So even when lambda is non-zero, is everything. And okay. Nevertheless, we have this object, and even more, we are observing these clusters and measuring their dimensions. And this proving that our understanding is absolutely correct. Okay. We're just measuring it. And the same, for example, when we are observing acoustic peaks, you know, you heard about this. Acoustic peaks also are giving, we can compute according to general physics, mm -hmm. what is the characteristic dimension of this distance, characteristic distance between two peaks. We know this and we are observing and it is exactly for this model, it's absolutely on the plane. Therefore, we know geometry of our universe with enormous precision today. And this is new experimental facts because physicists now, we know this, physicists believe the result, which it is confirmed by different experiments and also by different methods. Therefore, every new method is important because it is, it's proving that everything is correct, that there is no degeneracy or something. It's absolutely true. And that picture which you uh, saw uh, in uh, when I was reading this book at the beginning, in the first half of the 60s, it was amusing, but there were three parameters. Is it closed? This, we know that our universe is very close to be flat. Very, very close. You are big boss, whom you are permitting to talk. Okay, I'm here. So currently there is more than three sigma tension of the uh, me uh, measured value of Hubble constant between uh, CMB and supernova data. And from synapse observation and X-ray observation, one can also determine the value of Hubble constant. So what is your view that when Erosita will detect lots of clusters, do you think it can be an alternative probe to put some light between this, uh, uh, this tensor? I have no, okay, there are data which are published. Every experiment has some uncertainty or people believe that somebody is over Hating, making uh, statement too strong, and so on. Irosita and ground-based experiments together, this synergy, they will give us a lot of new information. For 100,000 clusters, every individual cluster will give its value. Therefore, this will be tremendous, interesting, and so on. But please also understand that when we are speaking about supernovae, it is, this is information about redshift, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 1, maximum is one and a half. When we are speaking about clusters, it is the same. But when Planck is observing last scattering surface, it's redshift 1100. 
And maybe there is something in between. You understand me? Maybe we are void, living in huge void and so on. We can prove a lot of, we, we can find something additional new, I hope. Because in reality, it's impossible that everything is so uh, simple. We are making today only knowing what we know. We are making simulations and are telling that we will detect three million black holes. But maybe it will be not three million, and then we will can look, you know, what the, what uh, leads to the change, not to three, but for example, three point seven or two point three. Why this result is different than simple simulation? We'll check a lot of. Thank you. Just a quick comment on this. Uh, the BEO measurements, which are over a similar redshift range, also give a separate, a different value. So, um, so oh, I agree with you. The question too. is yes. more open than that. I agree. question is not simple. But I told you that when Zwicky told us that there is a problem, there is 40 times not enough matter, and people were silent. 50 years, they were just living with this problem. You know, time to time they were remembering, then telling, because this guy is crazy, and this was all. You know, and then everybody recognized, yes, there is a dark matter, and everything is simple, and this dark matter is everywhere. And now every experiment shows, yes, there is dark matter, and there is even dark energy. But ask any person, what is dark energy or dark matter? Nobody will answer you. Because we do not have uh, physics which can make experiment which will demonstrate what is it. And today, all data are coming really only from astronomy. And Dick in the beginning demonstrated you, or during your lecture, you showed what is occurring in the first tiny parts of the second. And we see this also on the sum. Restrictions are coming from the Planck data, from the slope of uh, of the power spectrum of the initial perturbation. We are getting a lot of new facts from astronomy, and therefore this field is attracting a lot of people. I was going to make another quick comment, which is you mentioned that uh, you've been very fortunate, or we've been very fortunate with several coincidences, the fact that uh, the angular size of clusters is the same over large redshift range, that it's just at the scale where the silk damping is small, therefore we have same because same flux density uh, and same surface brightness. Um, so let me actually add one for the future, which is that um, there's also the polarized effect. Um, and it turns out that due to the orientation of, our, of the quadrupole, uh, of the CMB quadrupole, in fact, most of the polarized effect will be visible from the southern hemisphere, where all of the ground-based CMB experiments are that have a chance of, of seeing this. So you really are a fortunate man. <laughs> You're yes. all very no, I am very fortunate. Thank you. I am very glad. But I am much more interested because uh, polarization of cluster of galaxies is very, how to say, uh, is extremely sensitive to quadrupole component of CMB in the vicinity of the cluster. And if we are observing, for example, clusters at redshift 1.5, then there is a, we do not see, we cannot see quadrupole there by any way, but polarization of clusters will tell us what is the quadrupole component there, which today is already not quadrupole at all. This is important and pity I had in time, but I can tell you there is another effect which is really great because it is in a kinematic effect which permits us to measure velocity of every cluster of galaxies relative to the CMB. And therefore, when we are observing very distant cluster of galaxies at redshift 1.5, we can say which is moving from us with relativistic velocity. We can say practically about cluster, every cluster of galaxies that relative to CMB, its velocity is less than a few thousand kilometers per second, less than 1% of the recession or 
0.1% of the recession velocity. And this is enormous. You just show that Copernicus was correct. Einstein is correct. Everything. You know, we just, one thing, we are living, uh, reading our Bible, and we believe that Bible or any holy book is correct. But here, we just measure and telling that everything is going according to the formula which we are writing. Because it is experiment, and nobody, when I'm telling about this, people are angry. It's trivial. It's written in every test book. Yes, it shows that our test books are correct. And this is good. And this new experiment which demonstrates this. And it is a beautiful thing. Very simple and so permitting you to measure what <laughs> there is CMB which we do not uh, see at very far. And uh, cluster is just scatters photons and you see the change of the brightness due to velocity. Sorry. <laughs> question. Um, one of the fundamental things is what happens to groups. So what would Rosita be able to tell us about uh, gas and groups? Uh, showed that I think 10 to the 14th H inverse was your uh, what your uh, count figure was, but go below that? Yes, I show you. We will show here. You see, this will be, that is one. I think this is two or three times 10 power 13. It's very close to la our local group, rather close. And we cannot observe normally, but using this soft detector, we hope to detect even if gas is hot. Therefore, you know, I, I know that in Russia there are always great plans, but result not, uh, is not always so great. Therefore, I'm very, very afraid to say that we will do this, this, and this. We hope to do this. And if device will work properly, if spacecraft will work properly, if we will get very good students, it will be done. It's possible. It seems that everybody does. So I think uh, it was, uh, thank you, Rashid, again, for a very fantastic lecture.